I think we're going to get started. Um, I'm going to wish you a good afternoon. Thank you for joining me. Um, my name is Quayla Lucas. I'm an instructor in the Department of Criminal Justice, and I'm very excited to be here this afternoon to talk with you all about a very important topic, uh, revenge porn. Um, I wanted to just kind of give you a little bit of background about myself. Um, I specialize in cyber victimization, so this is an area that um, hits kind of close to home for me. I'm very passionate about it. Um, one of my first publications as an academic was actually surrounding cyber victimization. Um, since you guys are here today, I'm assuming that you may be interested in reading a little bit more about um, some of the subject area that I uh, specialize in. So before you leave here today, if you're interested in grabbing a copy of a publication that um, I worked on a few years ago, I have a few copies of my book chapter up here. Um, it's featured in the book, The Intersection Between Intimate Partner Abuse, Technology, and Cybercrime. And the title of the piece is Sexting, Sextortion, and Other Internet Sexual Offenses. I only have a couple copies, but if anybody's interested in grabbing one and we happen to run out for whatever reason, I also have a sign-up sheet here. Um, I'd be happy to email you a copy of it um, if you're interested in reading a little bit more about it. Um, but like I said, I'm very excited to uh, talk about this topic today because um, in some sense, a lot of people aren't familiar with it. Um, so I first wanted to start off my presentation by presenting a, a case study that I had come across in an article written by Sarah Bloom. So this is Anne Marie's story. Anne Marie's long distance boyfriend Joey had been pressuring her for months to take nude photographs. He missed her, he claimed, and he wanted to admire her beauty while they were apart. Joey swore they would stay on a CD hidden in a drawer in his room and he would be the only one ever to see them. However, in February 2010, the day after Joey and Anne Marie broke up, he called her in a rage. He accused her of sleeping with three other men and based the allegation on information obtained from her Facebook page. Anne Marie denied the accusations and tried to reason with him, but Joey refused to believe her. Joey threatened to start an eBay auction for the CD of the 88 naked images of Anne Marie that he had previously sworn to keep private. He also informed her that he would send the link to all of her friends, family, and coworkers at the college where she was employed. I will destroy you, he promised. Anne Marie called the police that very night. The police told Anne Marie that there was nothing that they could do to protect her because no crime had been committed. The next day, Joey kept his promise and the auction went live. The eBay posting was titled, the, in, uh, the name of Anne Marie's college, English Professor Nude Photos. Anne Marie also discovered that Joey had posted the eBay links on five of her college's Facebook pages. She received messages from friends, her ex-husband, and a former babysitter alerting her of the auction. Anne Marie reported Joey on Yahoo and Facebook. She even contacted the police again, but the officer reiterated that there was nothing that they could do. Frustrated, Anne Marie decided to go to the police station with printouts of the auction website. The officers there snickered at the pictures and looked amused at her problem. For the next year, Anne Marie lived in perpetual fear. She would often wake up in the middle of the night in a panic. Then, in September 2011, her worst fears came true when she Googled her name and found that a profile had been created for her on a pornography website. The title was, Hot for Teacher, Will Come Get It, and it included her full name, the city where she lived, and the college where she worked. An individual that Anne Marie had never met was even chatting with online strangers purporting to be her. The photographs had been up for two weeks and had already been viewed 4,000 times. She later discovered that copies of the CD were mailed to both her son's Catholic school kindergarten teacher and the head of her department at the college where she was employed. Anne Marie went to the police again who said there was nothing that they could do until an actual crime had been committed. One even looked amused at her problem. She feared going outside because her full name accompanied the photographs and she worried she might be stalked. She called her college and requested medical leave that day, but her request was, her request was denied. Two days after she discovered her photographs on the porn website, she attempted to end her own life. Fortunately, she was not successful. Two weeks later, she brought her case to a state trooper. The state trooper was sympathetic to her case, but once again said there was nothing he could do because there was no laws in place to protect victims like her. Anne Marie described this moment as the turning point, which pushed her to become an advocate for anti-revenge porn legislation. Well then, I'm going to change the law, she vowed. Anne Marie then joined the ranks of women fighting a dangerous offense known as revenge porn. So starting off talking about this idea of revenge porn, we know already that the evolution of technology has allowed users to access a wealth of information and communicate with others all around the world. However, research indicates that for more than a decade, the internet users have used various means to, uh, as a form of uh, media to bully others. 
A newer form of cyberbullying, most commonly as revenge porn, is becoming more and more prominent with the growing popularity of sexting and sending nudes to intimate others. The behavior can generally be classified as outing, which is a type of cyberbullying that consists of the sharing of someone's personal information without their permission to do so. For those unfamiliar with cyberbullying, it is conceptualized as a form of bullying that takes place through technological means to deliberately harass, threaten, humiliate, or intimidate someone. In order to be con considered true cyberbullying, there must be an intention to hurt, a perception that the behavior is harmful, repetitive behaviors, and an imbalance of power between the perpetrator and the victim. Research demonstrates that victims of cyberbullying suffer from a wide range of psychosocial consequences such as stress, frustration, and anger. In more extreme cases, victims also exhibit suicidal ideation. So what is revenge porn? Right now, there is no universal definition for revenge porn, which is often referred to as non-consensual consensual pornography or involuntary pornography. The more commonly known name, revenge porn, is derived from scorned ex-husbands or ex-boyfriends who post pictures of their former girlfriends or wives to humiliate them or as retaliation for ending their relationship. The term can also be used to describe other types of relationships, such as those between classmates and roommates, where intimate photos are posted and distributed as a way of bullying someone. The behavior is often conceptualized as the online sharing of sexually explicit material without the consent of the pictured individual. In many <coughs> cases, the photos originate in the context of an intimate relationship where the image is shared between partners, such as through sexting. In other cases, women have had their phones or computers hacked into and the images were then posted online. Another aspect to this behavior that makes it so concerning is that perpetrators frequently post identifying information of the individuals featured in the pictures. For example, their full, their full name, their address, or their place of employment. Non-consensual pornography seems to be increasingly utilized by the perpetrator as retaliation for romantic relationships going south, and it is becoming more and more prominent with the growing popularity of sexting. Sexting is conceptualized as sending, receiving, or forwarding sexually explicit messages, photographs, or images, primarily between mobile phones. Sexting is a prevalent and normalized practice among youth in many Western liberal, liberal democracies. In fact, many couples engage in sexting. In a 2011 study, 54% of the sample had sent explicit pictures or videos to their partners at least once, and one-third of their sample had engaged in such activities occasionally. In areas where gender roles traditionally expect men to initiate sexual encounters, sexting is used by women to offer nude images to male partners, allowing women greater latitude to instigate sex. Mass media does not encourage teen or underage sexting because of the child pornography laws they could violate. There are undoubtedly multiple risks when sending or receiving a sext, and these risks are something that often participants do not consider. Some young people blackmail their sexual partners and formal partners by threatening to release private images of them, which is a practice known as sextortion. This is a relatively broad category of sexual exploitation that involves the abuse of power as a means of coercion, where sexual information or images are used to extort sexual favors from the victim. Other phenomena that are related to non-consensual pornography include upskirting and downblousing. Upskirting is the practice of making unauthorized photographs under a woman's skirt, capturing an image of her crotch area, her underwear, and sometimes her genitalia. The term upskirt can also refer to a photograph, video, or illustration which incorporates an upskirt image. The practice is regarded as a form of sexual fetishism and is similar in nature to downblousing. Some of these images can be widely distributed or posted onto the internet without the knowledge and consent of the subject, for example, following a relationship breakup. These two forms of lewd behavior are controversial because currently there are many states that do not deem the behavior to be illegal. Specifically, courts have ruled that when the activity occurs in a public space, such as a grocery store or on public transportation, it is not illegal. If you're out in public, people can photograph you. Because this problem is fairly new for state legislatures, women usually have to persuade them that the behavior is harmful. Given that this issue generally doesn't affect men, they are often not quick to address it. The first documented outing of nude photos took place in 1980 when Hustler magazine published an article titled Beaver Hunt, where nude photos of an unwilling woman, women were stolen and uh, sent to the magazine without their knowledge. Revenge 
porn websites began to emerge on the internet around the year 2000. In 2010, non-consensual pornography gained national attention with the creation of the website isanyoneup.com, which was dedicated to the use of pornography for spiteful purposes. The site's creator, Hunter Moore, argued that victims of revenge porn are deserving of such abuse. Other websites which have followed the same course do so for entertainment purposes. In 2014, it was estimated that more than 3,000 pornographic websites that fit, the, that fit the revenge genre were found online. In the same year, non-consensual image sharing made headlines when uh, dozens of celebrities' private photos were exposed. In these cases, an Illinois man published over 500 photos of celebrities, almost all of them women, that he had stolen from their email and online storage accounts. He had obtained target login credentials through a series of phishing attacks over the course of almost a year. Victims of this hack included actresses, models, and athletes. Many of the celebrities targeted have spoken out about the emotional distress that they have experienced from this invasion of privacy. Media coverage of non-consensual pornography largely focuses on instances when celebrities have had private <coughs> or explicit photos or videos made in public without their consent, but this experience is not limited to the famous and newsworthy. A recent study conducted by the Data and Society Research Institute found that roughly 3% of all online Americans have had someone threaten to post nude or nearly nude photos or videos of them online in order to hurt or embarrass them. In addition, 2% of online Americans have had someone actually post a photo of them online without their <coughs> permission. Taken together, 4% of internet users, which comes to 1 in 25 online Americans, have either had sensitive images posted without their permission or have had someone threaten to post photos of them. Among all online Americans, 3% have had someone threaten to post these photos in order to hurt or embarrass them. Young people ages 15 to 29 are the age group most likely to report being threatened with the potential sharing of nude or nearly nude images, with one in 14 internet users under the age of 30 experiencing this compared with 2% of adults aged 30 and older. Young women in particular are more likely to be targeted. Statistics show that one in 10 women under the age of 30 have experienced threats of non-consensual image sharing, which is a much higher rate than either older women or older and younger men. Young adults are more likely than older adults to have had someone post an explicit photo without their permission. Men and women are equally like, likely to have someone post a photo. Individuals who identify as LGB are far more likely than those who identify as heterosexual to have experienced threats of or actual non-consensual image sharing. In addition, many victims of non-consensual image sharing and related threats have had an account or a computer hacked. <coughs> There are three main types of tangible effects that victims of non-consensual pornography experience. The first tangible consequence that victims can experience is trouble in the workplace. These nude photographs can damage a woman's reputation in the office when they are sent to coworkers and employers. The pictures are, also, are often posted on dozens if not hundreds of websites which flood Google searches when an individual's name is searched. This is not only highly embarrassing to the victim, but can also negatively impact their future careers. Employees frequently rely on online searches to research potential candidates. A woman's reputation is often so damaged that she, she may be forced to change her name. Sometimes this measure is not enough as there are cases where harassers discover the name change and repost the photograph and link them to a new one. Whether it is from damaged reputations, lost customers, or actual losses of employment, these sexual online pictures can destroy a woman's career. The second tangible consequence of non-consensual pornography is increased vulnerability to suicide. According to a study from the Civil, Cyber Civil Rights Initiative, 47% of revenge porn victims have contemplated suicide. This is especially felt in teenage and younger populations of revenge porn who have been more fragile and susceptible to bullying. Tragically, online harassment and sharing sexual photographs have caused some young teenage girls to commit suicide, as in the case of Audrey Potts and Jessica Logan. Last, victims of non-consensual pornography can become targets of, or threats of physical harm. Women whose photographs are posted on these websites are emailed or even physically stalked by men who view, the, who view the pictures. This danger is facilitated by the fact that the very personal information often accompanies the victim's photographs. Another way these women can be threatened is by the men who possess these damaging pictures. 
For example, they may force women to engage in unwanted sexual intercourse in exchange for refraining from posting the videos or pictures or sending it to loved ones or employers. Victims of non-consensual pornography also experience an intangible loss in their offline and online lives. Online, a woman's freedom is restricted when she is forced to avoid certain websites, change email accounts, and withdraw from online communities. By presenting a woman in a sexual light she did not choose, it conveys the message that she is a toy for the sexual amusement of others. This intangible loss of liberty is felt offline as well because the harassing activity forces victims to change how they interact with society. Women may feel a fundamental violation of their trust in others, which damages their future relationships. In addition, they are fired or quit their jobs because of the harassment, or these women fear being in public places where they could be recognized or physically stalked. <coughs> this type of behavior is seen as a form of misogynistic abuse that is often normalized in the online space. Women who make up the majority of victims are often objectified and have little resource for help in the matter. It is important to note, however, that this behavior can affect heterosexual and same-sex partners and can be perpetrated by both male, males and females. There is also a link between revenge porn and domestic partner violence because perpetrators hold power over their victims in order to control them by any means necessary. Researchers and academics point to the fact that victims are often wrongly blamed for bringing their offenses on themselves. Where where it be because of what they wear or what positions they put themselves in. Perpetrators are rarely blamed for their behavior and sometimes they are given a typical pass that boys will be boys. Ultimately, the patronizing assumption that it is only stupid girls who are victims of revenge porn shows a lack of understanding of the issues, especially since many of the images are obtained via hacking, secret recording, or other illicit means. Regardless, even if the images were voluntarily sent, they were done so with an implied agreement of trust between parties. As victims have become more vocal in decrying abuses, politicians have taken notice. At a national level, California Representative Jackie Spire introduced legislation in 2016 making non-consensual pornography a federal offense punishable by up to five years in prison. The bill, which is called the Intimate Privacy Protection Act, would make it a crime to distribute a visual depiction of a person who is identifiable from the image itself or information displayed in connection with the image and who is engaging in sexually explicit conduct or of the naked genitals or post-prevescent post female nipple of a person with reckless disregard for the person's lack of consent to the distribution. The definition of sex, sexually explicit is inherited from existing laws, and the term reckless is to be interpreted by the prosecutors themselves. A draft law has received backlash, however, because some argue that it imposes free speech. There is much bipartisan support in the bill, however. Regardless of this development, progress is being made across the country. Before the year 2013, only three U.S. states had criminal laws against non-consensual pornography. Currently, there are 38 states in the District of Columbia that have anti-revenge porn statutes on the books. And this also includes the state of Kansas, which you can see the, the definition for how they divine, or define this type of crime. Fortunately, victims are also finding more supportive networks, including those listed on this screen. Some concluding thoughts. There is no doubt that non-consensual pornography is a difficult crime to monitor and police, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't pretend it's not a crime. Sharing naked photos of somebody without their consent is a serious crime, whether you know them or not, whether that person shared them with you personally at one time or not. Of course, there needs to be more education among girls and boys, as well as adult media users, about the consequences of sharing naked photos of themselves. But there also needs to be education about the consequences of committing the crime of sharing people's photos without their consent. It is also important to note that the term revenge porn <coughs> is very distracting. It is also inaccurate and it minimizes the harms of this growing phenomenon. Revenge porn should be called out for what it is. It is image-based sexual abuse. Survivors say that the term revenge porn trivializes their experience. It makes them feel as if they've done something wrong in order to justify an act of revenge. And the focus on porn encourages victim blaming, as if they shouldn't have taken or allowed to be taken these videos or pictures. Sometimes this behavior is not just about revenge. 
What about hackers? It's not just about sharing images. What about the creation, including upskirting images and down blousing images? Would laws be put into place more hastily if women were to take unwanted photos of men in their crotch areas? A new term, image-based sexual abuse, better describes the nature and the harms of the deeply harmful actions of men, and it is mostly men who perpetrate this crime. Indeed, this behavior is not porn. The word porn implies that there's some form of consent taking place. It is a form of abuse, and the abuse is sexual in nature, meaning that it is criminal behavior. What we also need is a comprehensive legal reform. This means that all states and countries across the world criminalizing the sharing of private sexual images without consent, whatever the motivation of the perpetrator, as well as the threats to share. It means making upskirting a criminal offense as well as sexual extortion. Progress is being made, however, states need to catch up to the ever-evolving cyber world that defines our reality. Therefore, much more needs to be done. More and more legislators and criminal justice personnel are viewing it in a similar light, and they will continue to take a serious stance in their policies and punishment to respond to current victimization and to prevent future ones from occurring. Thank you very much. So I'd like to open up the floor if anybody has any questions or just general comments about um, this topic. I'd be happy to try to shed some light on it for you. Yes? Do you know which of the 12 states they are that don't have laws? I do not know off the top okay. of my head. Okay, that's fine. Not off the top of my head, but um, small amount for sure. Yes. Is there a lot of research on the transgender community because I noticed in your slide that they said LGBT. <coughs> like because there's also like the Q T plus. Sure. Is there any research on those? Not that I'm familiar with. In the study that I had found, they only ch focused on um, sexual orientation of people, not so much um, the gender aspect. Um, it will be a very interesting thing to see in the future, however, because we know that individuals who identify as transgender do suffer from victimization much more than other populations, um, but I'm not familiar with any literature that pertains to them specifically with uh, revenge porn. Do they look at it different when it involves uh, those under the age of 18, when it involves minors? Do they call it something else, or is it still classified as revenge? Well, in that case, if there's uh, imagery being distributed for anybody that's under the age of 18, it would be primarily classified as child pornography. Um, so whenever we talk about sexting or anything related to that, um, anybody that is in that image that's under that age of 18, um, it's child pornography either way. So we could kind of see the, the crossover with the same type of behavior and phenomenon, but because of their age, we simply refer to it as uh, distribution or possession of child pornography. Yes? Do we know anything about the rates in which revenge porn occurs and how that law has been passed against it? But is that slow hanging down or? Well, that's interesting that you brought that up. It seems like just in the past couple years is when all the states sort of took hold of this. Um, like I said, it, before the year 2013, there was only a very, very small amount that had to be laws in place. I'm assuming that researchers are going to take this into consideration and try to see if the revenge porn laws are doing anything. Um, but as of this time, I don't believe that there's any literature about that. to hear from you guys has anybody ever heard of the the terms before upskirting and down blousing you heard of upskirting yeah it's something that you know it's been around for a really really long time but in terms of the technology that we have you know people when they have the capability to take these pictures they're they're taking advantage of it so a lot of the case studies that I've looked into that have involved down skirting or I'm um, sorry down blousing and upskirting um, a lot of the situations were women simply in a public space. You know, the one case that I had read, there was a lady, she had uh, worn a dress to a grocery store, and she had noticed that a man behind, was behind her following her in the grocery store, and every time that she was picking something off of the shelf, or the shelf, he would get really close to her, bend down as if he were tying her shoe, and then at one point he noticed that he, she was snapping, or he was snapping pictures up her skirt. 
Um, there's also similar cases on um, areas of public transportation as well, but uh, the courts are saying that it's not a breach of privacy because you're in a public space. Um, so that right there is pretty controversial, and um, we'll see how many people sort of challenge that, that law or that decision um, as it's come out because, um, again, with technology, it seems as though the courts simply are having a hard time catching up with um, our technology as it evolves. You know, something that we really haven't had a problem with here um, a couple of years ago, a couple decades ago. So it's kind of like a newer um, problem for them to address. Any other questions or comments that I could shed some light on? Yes, Do you know why we don't uh, act on revenge porn as much as men? Well, I think if we look at the perpetration of crime overall, we know that men are usually the perpetrators to begin with. Um, I think that because this is such a crime that is so sexual in nature, um, we can assume that men are going to be the perpetrators, even if we look at um, you know, statistics of sexual assault and rape, um, domestic violence even. Um, most of the time it is males who perpetrate it. Um, there's very, very few literature out there on women who um, perpetrate this type of crime, but I think just given the nature of it, um, men are responsible for this behavior more so than women. In terms of in enforcing it, I know there's um, a lot of it is, has to do with hacking. Um, how do states really go about enforcing that side of it without more like extensive uh, cyber security units within their police force? Um, sure, and the, the hacking thing is what really makes this kind of unique because hacking is already so hard to police to begin with. You know, a lot of times hackers we don't know their identity or they can quickly, you know, sort of change routes so that it's hard to, to catch them to begin with. Um, I know that there are states that have different laws in place where if a hacker were to be caught, um, it is looked at as being an invasion of privacy and an offense. Um, but in terms of the relationship with revenge porn, it's the same kind of thing where the courts aren't able to sort of keep up with it. You know, most of the time when people think of revenge porn, rather than assuming that those images were stolen off of somebody's device, um, we automatically sort of get that victim blaming in where we're saying, hey, maybe this, this woman or this female shouldn't have sent those images. Um, so I think in terms of like the court's response to it, it's kind of similar where, you know, we're, we're not really assuming that these images were stolen, that it, it is the, the woman who dis distributed it at some point. Um, fortunately, we do have laws in place for those hackers, but um, any, any cyber crime that we look at, it, it's not as easily policed or um, handled as well as we hope that it is. Um, a lot of times with hacking, too, it, it depends on um, different websites and different companies and different businesses to have security in place. So, for example, if images were stolen off of Facebook, rather than um, you know dealing with that as a, a law enforcement issue, states will look at it as you know why why did Facebook allow the, this this information to be leaked? So uh, one of, one of the challenges about hacking is just you know we're so connected overall that it's just kind of a really really big issue for everybody to deal with. Um, and again, the, the courts are, they're trying to catch up, but I think that it's, uh, it's a very much a challenge to do so. So I hope that answered your question a little bit. Yeah, thanks. Great. Yes? I guess I'm a little confused on why your talk doesn't stress more of good idea not to even take these given the fact that hacking is, is the main way that people get obtain these pictures and I'm just struggling to figure out why I need sexually explicit pictures of myself unless I want people to look at them. sure and you know I think that a lot of it is a generational issue you know if we look at relationships between younger people these days especially in the age of technology it's just kind of a thing that people do between intimate partners. I mean, it's kind of looked at as flirting, um, especially people that maybe have a long distance relationship or anything like that. So a lot of times whenever these images are shared, it is done so in a trusting relationship. But as we know, um, you know, not, relationships don't always work out. Um, but you know, the, the whole image sending thing, I mean, that's, that's a behavior that's not going to go away. Adults send these images back and forth 
more often than we may think that they do. Um, and especially with these younger generations, it, it's just something that, that occurs and something that we need to sort of recognize and accept, I guess, at this point. I guess if that's going to be the case, I don't see how you can control this problem. Sure, and it, it is hard to control. Going to sort of communicate back and forth and maintain, uh, you know, sexual desire or whatever have you be in relationships like that. There is a risk associated with that. I think that that's a big component with the education part of it. So if we can increase awareness about these issues and educate people about the risks involved with trading these images back and forth, um, however, it's not going to prevent people from doing it all together. It, it's just something that, that's going to keep happening, especially with, with technology. I mean, we have so many ap applications out there. We have so many different features on our phones that make it very easy to exchange these images. Um, but if we can, again, kind of educate people and increase awareness, hopefully that can prevent some people from exchanging these images or, you know, initiating that, that fire in the relationship in other ways. Yes? Uh, that point kind of interests me. I think that while, yes, it would be smart to not take those pictures of yourself and to just not have them because if you don't have them, they're not going to get out there. That's sort of victim blaming, don't you think? Absolutely. Like, we should all be responsible adults and realize that we're not supposed to share these pictures unless we have consent. Yeah, and that's one of the biggest criticisms that we have with this phenomenon is just the fact when, whenever we, you know, have somebody in this situation, um, typical or most of the time an initial response is sort of that victim blaming where we say kind of same thing if you um, think about victim blaming in terms of sexual assault you know I know there's a, a display on campus here um, in the next day or so what was she wearing you know if she was wearing a mini skirt or anything like that she was asking for um, she was asking to be assaulted so same kind of idea here just in the cyber world where you know, if somebody's in a situation like this and you're exchanging your photos back and forth, rather than concentrating on men who are the main perpetrators of it, most people are going to blame the women and say, hey, you shouldn't have changed or you shouldn't have exchanged those images back and forth. Uh, you kind of, you know, you reap what you sow almost. Um, and that, that's one of the biggest criticisms about this, uh, this behavior. And, and I agree with you. I think that it is um, a form of victim blaming. Absolutely. One of the things that I kind of, um, I, I chuckled at when I was uh, doing research on this, um, you know, on this uh, phenomenon and even like the upskirting and the downblousing, um, a lot of times whenever the laws were put in place, um, you know, it was kind of like a knee-jerk reaction to an assault that had already happened. If we were to sort of flip the script a little bit and if we, again, like I said, said, if we had men or if we had women taking pictures of men in their crotch areas and we had men who were complaining about it to legislators, we would see laws put in place almost immediately, right? But because of women and sort of because our, our hierarchy and where we fall and this idea of victim blaming and uh, the rape culture that we currently live in, um, this is just sort of another challenge that females deal with, I think. Yes, Connor? Uh, kind of going along with what you just I'm curious on if there's any um, statistics on how often the gender roles are flipped. I mean, I know revenge porn happens predominantly men uh, disseminating pictures of women, but I'm sure. curious if there's any numbers on when it happens in the opposite. Just if there are, I'm not, I'm not familiar off the top of my head, but I would believe that it would be very, very small numbers compared to females, obviously. Um, another study to consider in the future, definitely, um, because there have been cases where, you know, even if the men weren't necessarily in an intimate relationship, I mean, there's cases, um, the name kind of escapes me, but there was a college student um, at a university, his roommate had leaked images of him engaging in sexual activity in their dorm room, and he had leaked that out to other people, right? And unfortunately, that, um, that young man had committed suicide as a result of the, the bullying and the harassment that he had done. Um, but the perpetrator in that case, I mean, it was, it was same sex right there, right? Um, unfortunately, because this is a newer phenomenon and because of the, um, the nature of the abuse and just trying to find an overall sample to get those statistics, I think that's one thing that sort of challenges it. Um, but I think that in the past couple of years, it seems like the attention to this matter has been increased. So I would not be surprised if there was more studies being conducted out there focusing on um, males as, as victims, for sure.
questions or just general comments? Well, I really appreciate your time and your attention. I'm hoping that my talk at least kind of, again, increased awareness about this issue. Um, if you would ever have any questions or, you know, just want to come talk with me about any of this, um, my door is always open. I'd be happy to do so. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I do have um, some copies up here of the book chapter that my uh, colleague and I had published about uh, revenge porn and sextortion and sexting, um, those kinds of crimes. So if anybody's interested in grabbing one, please feel free to do so. Um, otherwise, I hope you guys have a good afternoon. So thank you.